first of all, kind of a show of hands, I want to get a general idea. How many of you are millennials? So a good, good group. Um, typically when I come to these, it's geared more towards the younger millennial entering the workforce in the coming, you know, year or two. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, anyway, so we want to talk about saving for retirement. Um, and Steve and I were talking beforehand, you know, saving has got to be a strategy. It's got to be important to you. Um, I'm just going to see how much money I have left at the month, at the end of the month, and I'm going to save that. It's not really a strategy for saving, so you've got to commit to this. Um, let me back up just a little bit because I did want to tell you a little bit about myself and what I do. Um, I am a graduate of the University of Arkansas in accounting, and I have an MBA from there. And I manage the investment portfolio for Pen Air. So I, I uh, work on behalf, I represent Pen Air, I work for Pen Air, and manage the credit union's portfolio. So I, I kind of want to throw that out there because it's been about five years since I've had my license to directly speak and give advice to individuals on investment decisions. So. Um, I do have experience, and I have previously been licensed, but Steve, uh, my colleague, who will be speaking to you guys next, is licensed, and so if there's any questions you have, please throw them my way, but I may be um, throwing those back off on Steve, because he's probably more qualified to answer the specifics, because when it comes to investing, you know, no two people are the same, and no two situations are the same, and it's going to really take sitting down with someone who's a professional and really looking at your situation and, and what kind of investments fit your situation. These are the type of things Steve is going to cover <laughs> after me. I want to kind of go over a broad view of saving for retirement. Some of the terms that you might hear um, have questions about, well, what is this and what is that? It all seems the same to me. So I want to go through, um, and that's kind of the angle I want to hit it from. I, I want you guys to be a little bit more informed um, so that when Steve gets up here and talks, uh, he can get more of the real, you know, get into the details of it. Um, again, saving is very important, and I, I can't believe I forgot my statistics, but I will say, go ahead for the millennial group, go ahead and pat yourself on the back, because early signs are showing that um, the millennial group has been saving more and starting saving earlier than some of their previous counterparts. Um, especially the baby boomers and the Gen Xers. So we hear a lot about, we get thrown around all the time, oh, the millennials are this, the millennials are that, you know, they're a bunch of spoiled brats. Well, they said the same thing about the Gen Xers whenever I was growing up. So I just do want to point that out, that you guys are on the right track. I hope you're absorbing some of this. And if any of you have seen one of the other presentations I do on how to make a budget, um, you will remember that one of the specific line items was saving, and so we want to kind of expand a little bit on that. Um, I guess a lot of the concern for the millennials comes from the fact that um, I just found a way to save an extra hundred bucks and put it in my 401k every month. It's not quite as sexy of a Facebook post as <laughs> check out my new whip, it's got leather seats. But again, like I said, this has got to be a commitment. This has got to be a almost one of your first line items on your budget. And you got to say, I, I want to save. Um, and, and ultimately, this will uh, make you much happier in the long run than you know that new car. So start off with a nice little quote. Um, it's about time. It's not about timing the market. It's about time in the market, um, especially for retirement savings. Okay, we're talking about what you're going to be living off of when you're finally quit working one day. Um, if you want to be a day trader and try, try your hand at that, I would not suggest doing that with your retirement savings. Um, that's more of timing the market, trying to time the ups and downs of the market to make money off of it. That's not what we're here to discuss. We're here to talk about saving money now. I'm not going to wake up and read the Wall Street Journal or, or read all the bad news on you know, how the stock market's down 100 points today, and oh my gosh, it's up 100 points tomorrow. We're just going to put that out of our head, and we're going to have a long-term focus, and, you know, maybe once or twice a year check to see how things will go. Now, I want to lay out a little 
example, and this, this really illustrates and should drive home the point. We've got two different situations, okay? Person A starts at the age of 22, and they're going to save uh, $100 a month. Person B is going to save $100 a month, but they're not going to start till the age of 32. They're going to live by this old um, myth about, oh, you know, I've got plenty of time to save for my retirement. I'm only 22 years old. I'm barely old enough to legally drink, much less save for retirement. So let's look at $100 a month saving. Rate of return of 9%. Uh, right now, Steve will probably tell you that's a little bit optimistic in today's market. Um, I don't know, actually, over the last few years, we've probably seen some of those returns. But over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, it's a little bit optimistic. I, did, I went back and looked. Since the inception of the S&P 500 in 1928 through 19, uh, 2014, the annualized return of the S&P, not including dividends, was roughly 10%. So this 9%, if you're looking out of a horizon over the next 30 to 40 years, is a realistic number. So I don't want you to think, oh yeah, he's assuming 9% growth. These numbers aren't real. This is really kind of what you can see over a long-term horizon. So we said $100 a month. This person's going to contribute for 10 years, $100 a month, $1,200 a year. Uh, pretty easy math, $12,000 that contributed of their own money over a 10-year period. Well, since we know each month that $100 goes in and starts earning interest, uh, you know, we've got compounding interest working at here. At the end of 10 years, that $12,000 is actually worth close to $19,000. If we let that $19,000 sit and add no more money to it and earn interest, earn a return over the next, um, to the age of 65, so the next 33 years, that $19,000, of which only $12,000 was contributed of your own money, turns into about $325,000. So if you wait 10 years and say, I'm too early, I'm too young to start saving for retirement, I need to start saving for a trip to Hawaii. Um, same $1,200 a, a year. Over 33 years, you would have contributed $39,600 of your own money, and it would have grown to $224,000. So by starting early and letting your money work, letting time work for you, you can save over an additional $100,000. Now. Yeah, that's great. I'll choose option A. But really what I want you to do is choose option A and then continue till the end of option B. So right there, $100 a month, you can see you're approaching $550,000 in savings for your retirement. How's that instead of a new Mercedes? So I want to go over a couple of common terms. These are things that, you know, when you start getting into looking at it, you know, what is an IRA? What is a 401k? What am I talking about when I, when I use some of these terms and some of the things that Steve will be using later on? So an IRA is an individual retirement account. It is the only option available to someone who is self-employed for retirement savings. Um, it is my understanding, Steve, you can comment on this, but it is my understanding that you must be 18 years old to participate in an IRA, and that's because only earned income can be contributed to an IRA. So if you're 12 years old and you contribute $5,500 to an IRA, um, then they kind of gets into, well, you know, child labor laws. Go ahead. I think if you're working under 18, that's possible, but yeah, then it becomes into, well, you know, how much money can someone under 18 legally work and earn? You're selling drugs, a lot of money. There you go. <laughs> well, so you can put your $5,500 in. <laughs> um, so, you know, it may not be a statutory law. I don't know the answer to this one, but a lot of places you go to, they won't really, because there gets into some gray areas and some questions like that, um, they won't really accept it retirement accounts for under 18. So kind of this rule of thumb, 18 is kind of that age when you can start. Um, but this is only earned income can be contributed. So you must have, if you have a, if you get a 1099 that says you earn, you know, $300 that year, you're not allowed to contribute $2,500 to an IRA. 
So there's three main types. There's really two main types, but there's two of them fall under kind of the same category. Um, there's the traditional IRA, which includes a SEP, and we'll talk about a SEP. That basically is means self-employed persons. They have a little bit different rules, but not really a whole lot. But a traditional IRA, the money that you put into it is tax-free. It comes out before you take, pay taxes. And when you begin retirement and start taking draws on that, that's when that money is taxed. The big thing here is that, you know, uh, one of the one of the benefits to an IRA, a traditional IRA, is that you can lower your tax burden now. Um, you know, if you're a high income earner and are looking for ways to reduce your tax burden, this is a great way to do it. However, any growth in that, whenever you start drawing on it at retirement, gets taxed. The opposite of that would be a Roth IRA. This might be something you've heard before. Um, the difference there is that the money is taxed before you contribute it. Over time, that money grows, and when you withdraw it, it's tax-free. So the real benefit there is all the growth in what you're contributing is tax-free. Um, this is one of those situations where I know probably some of you are thinking, oh, well, should I do a Roth or a traditional? That's one of those type of questions where it, you know, someone like Steve or, or the professionals that are in his group at Penn Air would, would need to sit down with you and look at your own individual situation and say, what's going to benefit you the most? So, you know, I, you know my, my only comment is that here's the difference in the two. You know, do you want to pay the taxes now? Uh, let the money grow and then, then it be tax free? Or do you want to get the tax break now and then pay the taxes at retirement whenever you start drawing on that? The third one, which is really under the same umbrella as a traditional, is called a SEP IRA, self-employed persons. Um, and the big difference here is that there's a no $5,500 a year limit on the contributions. Your um, regular traditional IRA, the government, up until a certain age, um, you know, basically everybody in the millennial group would fall under. Um, you can contribute, and I believe it's still $5,500 a year, Steve, is that correct? It might, it changes from time to time. And then there's a point in time, I think when you maybe turn 50, you're allowed to make some catch-up contributions and, and add more. Um, but a good rule of thumb to think of is you can only add $5,500 per year under a traditional IRA. Um, a a self-employed um, IRA, you get to add more than that. So there's no $5,500 a year limit. On the other side that you might have heard of is a 401k. Now, 401k, these are retirement plans that your employer has in place. Um, they're, they're offered generally through an employer, and um, the employer will actually match portions. You know, different, it's different for each employer, but they'll match a portion of, uh, of some of your contribution into this account. That's one of the biggest benefits of a 401k. And I tell a lot of the younger people that I work with or that work for me, you know, if you think you're not being paid enough for your job because you work so hard, contribute, you want to give yourself a 1% pay raise, contribute 1% more to your 401k if you're not at that maximum amount because as soon as you add another 1% in, you know, your employer is going to match that 1%. Um, there we go, that's the main difference in a 401k and an IRA. And, and again, different employers have different formulas for matching um, for pin air. Up to 7% of your income that you put in, Pen Air matches that too. And we have one of the most generous 401k programs I've ever seen. Um, we actually, for the first seven years, it's 7%. Year 8, it's 8%. Year 9, it's 9%. Year 10, it becomes 10% every year after that. So once you've been there 10 years, you can contribute 10% of your income, and Pen Air will match that. Now all of a sudden, you're saving 20% of your income. Another benefit of this is, you know, you say, what's the return on my 401k? Well, we're going to give you the return calculated based on the growth of the assets that are under that 401k. What it's not going to tell you is that every dollar I put in there, up until that limit that they match, they're putting a dollar in. So right there, you double your savings. So these are really the best plan if your employer offers it. Most 401k plans are, are traditional, meaning uh, before taxes, they, they, they come out before taxes. So when you get your pay stub, 
you say, oh, $1,000 was paid to me, well, why do I only have $700 in my bank account? Well, first of all, however much you tell them, they put over into your 401k savings. Then Uncle Sam dips his finger into it, pulls out what he wants, and then they pay you. Um, the new thing, uh, and I know we just started offering it for our employees, it may not be that new, but it's, it's new from what I've heard, um, is a Roth 401k. Works just like a Roth IRA. The contributions are after taxes and any um, earnings and withdrawals upon retirement are tax free. Um, so we said the employee contributions, so it's important to, to understand the different terms that we're talking about because these are the things, you know, the first day you go to the job, you got somebody from HR who comes and says, here's this pamphlet, this booklet of all of our benefits, one of those will be the 401k, and it starts having all this vesting period and, and terms like that. Well, I didn't understand, I have to go Google it probably. So the employee contribution, pretty self-explanatory, however much, you, you tell them a percent, um, I want to contribute 6% of my earnings, um, and that's what will be taken out each month. Um, the employer match, again, it's different per plan, a, a very common one is they will match um, 50 cents on the dollar, well, they'll match up to 3% um, if you contribute up to 6%. So, you know, if you contribute 2%, they'll match 1%, or if you contribute 6%, they'll match 3%, if you contribute 10%, they'll match 3%. So another one, um, did I miss one here? Okay, we'll go on to an example. So we say that the plan stipulates that the employer will match the employee's contribution up to 5% of wages. So we'll match at 100% up to 5% of your wages that you decide to contribute. So again, if you earn $50,000 a year and you decide to contribute 3%, which is $1,500 a year, then your employer will match 3%. If you contribute 8%, <coughs> then they will match up to 5% or $4,000. Or, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. You contribute $4,000, they'll contribute $2,500, which is the 5% of the $50,000. So, again, they, they limit how much they'll, they'll match, but that doesn't mean, oh, I should only, I should only go up to the 3% or 5% that we're gonna match. There are different strategies on how to do that. Again, Steve's group, and Steve can probably answer some of those questions, because I've had questions before it, Oh, my employer will match at 5%, and I want to say 10%. Should I put 5% into a 401k and 5% into an IRA, or should I just put the whole 10% into a 401k? You know, that's, again, that's different people, different scenarios. No two people's answers are going to be the same. That's where you need to sit down with a professional and go through your specific situation. So I can't give you an answer to the whole group and say, oh, everybody should do this. So there will be an eligibility period, meaning you have to, and, and, and a lot of times it's the same eligibility period for all benefits. So your health and dental, um, before you can start taking days off, they'll say you must work here X number of weeks or days or months. I believe ours is 90 days or six months. I don't remember, to be honest with you, it's been so long. Um, before you can participate in benefits, and, and especially in a 401k. And then there's this other term called vesting period. And that, as it says, is the length of time you have to be employed before you have access to those employer contributed <laughs> funds. So the eligibility period is six months and the vesting period is three years. After six months, you may begin making contributions to the 401k. And actually, I believe you can begin on day one, but the employer won't start matching until six months. So that's the participation part. Okay, so you, you actually are in the plan, so to speak, after six months. Um, the vesting period means that for that six months up to three years, your employer will continue to match what you put in, but it's not until three years. So if you quit in two years and leave or get hired off somewhere else, they're not obligated to pay you what they've matched up until that point, until you reach that three-year vesting period. So it's, it's there. 
it's kind of setting off in a separate account over here, but as soon as you hit that three year vesting period, now you have access to that. So if you leave, that's your money. There we go. That's what I was getting to. So if you leave before the three years up, the employer has no obligation to you to uh, for the contributions matched up until that point in time. So we're going to go through a, com a couple of common myths, and this is my favorite part because um, these are where you know we got questions, and I'm going to dispel some myths. So I need a good job with good benefits before I start saving. Well, companies that offer 401 pay contributions are great. Um, but the government says you can match up to, or you can contribute up to $5,500 a year into an IRA. Um, we saw in that first slide where I uh, laid out the benefits of starting early. So, I mean, even if you're you know, earning income, you can start contributing to an IRA. I should pay for my child's college tuition first. Steve, have you ever heard of some of these myths? <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, and, and while this is very important, especially you know, to those of you who have children in the room, I understand and I applaud you for wanting to look out for your children's future. But my answer to that would be, you know, you're sacrificing your future retirement savings, um, and should you run out of money during retirement, or well, one, you may have to. You, retirement age doesn't mean that's when you quit working. You know, that means when the government you can you are eligible to quit working. You can quit working when you can afford to quit working. Um, you know, you may be placing a financial burden on your child later on in life should you run out of retirement savings. Somebody's got to pick up the extra load. Another one, Social Security will cover all my expenses during retirement. <laughs> right? Well, the latest numbers they said is 2033 is when Social Security will run out. Uh, even at that, you know, I think the maximum Social Security benefits you can get now is nowhere, you know, near enough to live off of, at least comfortably. Um, I say you should count that as a bonus. Could, could I make a comment? Yeah. That? that gives the impression that Social Security goes out of business. And 2033 simply means that the amount that they pre-save for the baby boomer Correct. generation is Correct. gone. But after that day, if nobody does anything to the system, you're still going to get 75% of your benefits. Is that fair? That's debatable. Here, here's another big thing to question. One of the biggest things going on in the economy right now that any economists will tell you, and they're about to go to forecasters as weather forecasters, I understand, but they're the best ones that I got information from, um, is the labor force participation rate. The amount of participation rate of the younger generation is... It's declining so much, and that Social Security is so dependent on younger workers paying into the system and the older workers getting money, getting out of the system. I mean, the first ones that paid into it back in the 40s or whenever they established it were getting the benefits immediately. Um, and as you know, the generation of the baby boomers that's retiring and drawing on Social Security is much larger than, you know, what we see uh, of new younger generation entering the workforce that that's where we really have the imbalance and that's where they come to this 2033 is yes um, with steady you know the same amount in exiting the workforce is coming on board to pay into the system you know the same amounts paying in is being drawn on it should uh, it's a system that should go on forever but at this point in time there's more people drawing benefits than there are paying into it and that's where they hit this 2033 yes there will be a um, we will run out, so to speak, of our reserves. Will you still get your 75%? I don't know. I mean, if they don't, if there's not enough to pay into the system, then we have to start dipping into other budget items on, you know, the U.S. government budget. Do we want to operate at such a big deficit? You know, these are all questions that we don't know. We know that by 2033 is the latest estimate on when Social Security will run out of of its excess funds to sustain itself. So it will have to get those from somewhere else. And is that a line item that Congress and the President wants to cut from its budget? <coughs> That's where the uncertainty comes from. Either way, I wouldn't rely on Social Security being your only retirement benefit. It's too early for me to start saving. And if you haven't, if you take one thing from this, 
we ought to know that that's wrong. And I, as a joke, I said, this one's almost so dumb that I didn't even include it. <laughs> so if, unless you're under 18, you're not too young to start saving. Uh, and finally, this is a big one. I will spend less money once I'm retired. I bet Steve hears this a lot. A lot. And the reality is, even if you have all your debt paid off, you have your house paid off, all your cars, credit cards paid off, you're not going to get the same tax breaks as you were. You're not going to get to deduct your mortgage insurance from your taxes. You're not going to get some of these tax breaks that you're eligible for you know, when you had children, the child, child tax credit, things like that. Second of all, retirement brings a lot of free time. I mean, let's face it, if we're sitting around with free time with grandkids, you know, that, that's bleeding money. It brings a lot of more opportunities for, for uh, to spend money. And finally, the big one is your medical expenses will likely increase in retirement. So, you know, I will spend less money once I'm retired is a, is a, is a big myth. You will change the way you spend money, but I don't know that it will necessarily be less. My name is Steve O'Reilly. I'm with Penair Asset Management. Now, Asset Management is the brand name that Penair uses to offer financial planning, investment products, and insurance products to our members. And we do that through an agreement with Satera Investment Services. And Satera is a brokerage firm. Now, I've been in the investment business about 23 years. Before, before that, I was in accounting for seven years. And prior to that, I was right here on this campus. So I have a bachelor's in accounting from the University of West Florida. So the system works. Everything your professors are telling you, you apply yourself. If I can do it, anybody can do it. We're going to talk about today five principles. Now these are these are principles only. Not get rich quick. It's not the hot investment tip. So just block that out of your mind. Also, the examples I'm going to use, we want you to get the concept. The average person that we deal with in inner asset management, they're usually between 50, ages 50 to 70. So some of the examples we're using are more relevant to that. So the number is a little bit bigger. But just get the concept. Don't get hung up with the numbers. So we're going to talk about today your time horizon, your risk, your appetite for risk. We're going to talk about diversification, taxes, and then procrastination. And if you have any questions along the way, feel free to ask. Let's first look at your time horizon. Most investment professionals will tell you you need to determine how long of a time frame before you need your money, before you start it off. So there's three categories they fall into, short-term, mid-term, and long-term. My definition is short-term is usually between say, zero and five years. Mid-term is five to eight years, and long-term is eight to 10 years or longer. In my opinion, if you're in the short-term time frame, meaning less than five years, you don't need to be investing at all. That, that might sound strange. So let's define what investing means. Investing, in my mind, and most, most professionals will say, it involves a longer term time commitment and possible loss of principal. So for short term time frame, you need to stick to deposit based products, like savings accounts and certificates of deposit, which are not technically investments. So that's why I'm saying five years or less, don't even invest. Now, if it's something for medium term or long term, we can look at the investment in the investment world. Mid term is still iffy on the investments. Because to be successful in investing, it's a function of time. It's not if you're going to make money, it's just how much and how long is it going to take. So if you have a long term time frame, you will make money with, with a good investment. It's not gambling. I hear people say a lot, well, you know, investing is just like gambling. I can go to the casino. It's not the same thing. Now, it's true with either one, you don't know how much you're going to make. Investing, the, you're following a systematic plan, buying companies, in the case of stocks, knowing concerns 
So given the proper time frame, you will make money. It's just a question of how much. Gambling, on the other hand, you can sit at that table all day long or pull a slot machine all day long. Are you guaranteed to make any money? No. Matter of fact, how do you think they build those big hotels and give you free rooms to stay in? Because you're going to lose money over time. You know the old saying of the, the odds are in favor of the house. So that's why investing is not the same thing as gambling. Day trading will be close to gambling. And John had already mentioned that earlier. Don't do it. <laughs> so, let's look at risk. You've got to ask yourself some questions. Say, you have the time frame already in your mind. Okay. I have 8 to 10 years. My time frame is okay. It's for something long term like retirement. I have the time frame down. <laughs> now ask yourself some questions on, well, what happens to my, my outlook if the stock market goes down? How much can I afford to lose if the stock market goes down? How would I describe my investment knowledge? Do you know about investing at all? So these are this is the psychological aspect. And investing is a lot of a lot of nuances to it. The psychological aspect, in my mind, is probably one of the most important things. Do you have the constitution? That's an old term you don't hear much anymore. My grandfather used it. Do you have the emotional constitution to deal with market downturns? It is nice to talk about 10% return, 9% return, and all that. Those are just averages. Okay. Now, I'm assuming since we're on a college campus, everyone knows how an average works. Doesn't mean you get the same thing every year. It's a variance. So something can have a 9% return, and it can have years where it goes down 10%, and years where it goes up 10%. Those are averages. You have to ask yourself, when the stock market goes down, so I'm in the stock market investment, can I deal with it? My experience is people overestimate their risk tolerance. Deal with it all the time. People come in, yeah, I'm, I'm not afraid of the market. I'm going to put this money in there. I'll let it grow. That's no problem. I get a phone call. My account went down a hundred dollars. I got to bail out of this thing. Well, you were sitting here the other day talking all tough. So you really have to be honest with yourself. Okay? Some people just ought to not do it. And that's part of the job of the financial advisor. A good financial advisor can guide you. And I've had to tell people, you, you don't need to be going there. So I, I like to tell people, I'm kind of like a money therapist. I need a couch in my office. You know, lay down and tell me all about it. Here's something that might put the, the risk into a little more practical terms. Here's to ask yourself this question. Would I rather have $500 right now for a 50% chance of $2,000? Now it changes with the amount. Look to the right. Would I rather have $50,000 now in my hand or a 50% chance of $200,000? What you'll find is most people, what psychology works in the brain is if the sure thing it's not that meaningful to them, they'll take the risk. The higher the sure thing is, the less risk. They become more risk averse. So this, this is analogous to your money. You're saying right now, when you're starting out, you said, oh yeah, well, I take the 50% chance at 2,000. I might take the 50% chance at 200,000. As your assets build up and the money is more meaningful, you'll start to become more risk averse. So just look at the right. What if we put some zeros to that? Because y'all might be saying, I take the 50% chance at 200,000. I don't care about 50,000. Keep moving the zeros around till we go, what if it's 500,000 right now? I can give it to you right now, or a 50% chance at 2 million. And then you start thinking, I do a lot with 500,000. That's a sure thing. So that, that's how the psychology of risk works. What would you do? What would you do? Oh, me? Me personally? What would I choose? If you were like 20 years old. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, that's, yeah. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm 20, if I'm 20, well, it depends. See, the lot. See, here, here's a good example of like what John was talking about too in your personal circumstances. This one right here, I, I'd go with a 50% chance at, at 
2,000 all day long. It's 500. I mean, that's money. If I'm 20 years old, that's well, that's something. But I want to take a chance at 200 or 2,000. Now, this one right here, it depends on my circumstances. I did not have any college debt when I graduated here. However, if I'm 20 years old, let's say I owe $50,000 in student loans, that might influence me. I might go, well, I could wipe out all my debt, sure thing, or 50% chance of 200,000, but I might get nothing. I still have that debt. I'm, I'm kind of a risk averse person, even though I'm in the business. So in those circumstances, I would take, I'd give me $50,000. I'm wiping out my student loans. Now me personally right now, as I'm older and built up some things, $50,000 is a lot of money. It's not gonna change my life at the stage I'm at right now. So in that example, I would choose a 50% chance at 200,000, because I'd rather take the risk. 50,000 is not gonna change my life. Now when you move the decimal over to $500,000, and the two million, that's the tipping point where I would probably say, you know, give me the half a million. That's good. So it's, there's, and there's not a right or wrong. It just depends on how you're wired and what you can deal with. So let me answer this. Yes. Okay. Um, we were talking earlier about IRAs, Roth IRAs, 401ks. All, and then you said earlier that all of those have risk. The only difference is the tax benefits and you can't just match on 55. Is that correct? There's 59 and a half. You can take it out. Yes, sir. Okay, so my question would be, what if instead of just limiting myself to 5500 I took that and invested it in, say, a mutual fund, a front loader, back rear loader mutual fund, or something like, or even a stock? Um, I would have more chances of getting a higher return on that. What would be the benefit? Would it be any safer than the IRA or the other? I mean, so, so is the question, then, if I'm understanding, why, why stick with an IRA because of the limit? You can only do 5,500 versus something else where there's no limit. Is that what you're asking? And is it significantly safer than if I just put it in a mutual fund or another market tool? Oh, well, there is two things. There's, a, there's two, two parts to that, the way I'm understanding it. Why do an IRA because you're hamstrung by, by the contribution limits? And that's a true statement. You do get an extra $1,000 when you get old like me and you're over 50, and so you can do 6,500. But uh, oftentimes, it's not an either or, it might be a both and. So you do the IRA. Really, the best thing is, like John was saying, do the 401k. That that's, has higher contribution limits, anyways. But you can do the IRA and an investment outside the IRA. You can have a mutual fund in an IRA and outside of an IRA, so the risk factor is the same. An IRA is not a type of investment, it is a type of account that's designated for retirement. Think of it like a bucket. You can put in that bucket many different things, mutual funds being one of them, certificates of, of deposit, you can put in that bucket all kind of things. You can also have those investments outside of an IRA in a regular investment account. So you can have two parallel investments invested in exactly the same thing for the exact same amount of money. One's tax deferred and one's not. So the, uh, the investment part is kind of a non-issue. You can just, that can be the same. So basically, my only benefit to a retirement account is the tax benefit. Yeah, yes. Okay. And just to clarify, I know you, you may not have even meant it this way. The only benefit is tax deferral, but that only is a big thing. I mean, over years, I mean, that can be hundreds of thousands of dollars of growth. So it is a, it's not an insignificant thing, but it, it is the main benefit. Yeah. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Speaking I'm closer to your age than yours, probably. <laughs> but it's important to have both an IRA or some sort of retirement vehicle and an emergency savings account. That is correct. Because using an IRA in an emergency situation is very, very expensive. Yeah, yes, and uh, thank you for bringing that up. That's a good point. And in a longer class, we would deal with that. And that's the part of the financial planning pyramid. You need to establish your emergency fund of say $1,000 before you invest because you go and invest in an IRA and the AC breaks down on the car. Now you have to take money out of the IRA to fix the AC because you have no spare cash. And oh, by the way, because it's in an IRA, you have to pay a 10% penalty because you're younger than 59 and a half and then you'd have to pay ordinary income taxes on it possibly too. So uh, my dad used to call that getting gutted like a fish. <laughs> so, yes, sir. 
Although if it's a Roth IRA, you could take out what you put in at any time without penalty. Yes, you can take. Yes, if, they, if you contributed to the IRA, you can take out your contributions. Roth. Right, with a Roth. The Roth. With the Roth, that that is correct. It's better though. You're still rating a retirement fund because we know one thing's for sure: most people don't want to work till the day they die. Now that we differ on when the age is we want to retire. So once you designate, the key to success is once you designate something to that long-term bucket for retirement planning, you don't touch it. So that's why it's important just to get the order of things right. So even though we're talking about investing today, it's, it's jumping ahead a little bit of possibly where y'all are in the room, some of y'all. Get, get your emergency fund established before you start doing this. Also with the risk profile, we need to look at how risk is affected by the type of assets. We were talking about psychological stuff up until now. Now we're going to talk about investments. Cash and cash alternatives, low risk, low return. As you move up the, the ladder to the upper right, you got debt, stocks, and then speculative, higher risk, higher return. And in case y'all are getting any ideas here, this is not your credit card debt balance that you carry. And that, that is not an investment. That's referring to debt as in corporate bonds. Those are called debt instruments, debt investments. You are a creditor of a company. So don't let anyone tell you, contrary to what the commercials say, you don't make money by spending money. You, you make money by investing. And you have stocks, which are ownership in companies. And then speculative, that would be things possibly like artwork or uh, Snapchat stock. Yeah, hey, you, you might be rich one day, you might have nothing. So that's how that works. Also, along with the investment risks of asset classes, you have external risks and, and, and company specific risks. External risks, things like economic factors, interest rates, things that are outside of the company. Company specific risk, you could get a new CEO could have supply issues, those can affect an investment. It's important to understand this, you cannot get rid of risk. All you can do is manage it. Well, I can get rid of risk, Steve, I'll put all my money in the bank and there's no risk to that. It's insured for $250,000 and I am set and there's no risk. We're going to talk a little bit later, inflation. If you're earning half percent on that money and inflation historically averages at 4%, you're, you're going backwards. Or as a colleague of mine used to say, that's safely losing money. <laughs> you know, if you're going to lose money, you feel good about it. That's back to the psychological stuff. So one way to help manage risk, since we know we can't avoid it, is to diversify. So this example is going to show if we take $750,000, okay, don't get hung up on the amount, that's the concept, 750 in this case, and a single investment versus three other investments of 250 each. And what does diversification do? Well, the one where we put it all in one, if that got 5%, you'd have almost $2 million after 20 years. The other, you could have a little over $2 million if one of them got 8%, one of them got 6.5%, one of them went totally broke, you got nothing you would still have more than on the left hand. So you might be thinking, well, well Steve, that's, you know, that, that's not hard. I'm just going to put the, the whole 750 in the 8%. <laughs> well, that would be nice. If, if I knew all that, I would not be standing here right now. <laughs> the point of the example is you don't know what the investment's going to earn. That's why it's called investing. There's risk. We can go by averages. Whenever you look at investments, you're going to see a little disclosure. You'll see some of it on these slides. Past performance is not a guarantee of future performance. Oh, it always made 9%. Well, guess what? It may not make it in the future. The not knowing is why we diversify. Understanding market moves. When evaluating an investment, you want to look at the history of the return. You want to look at the management. And, and when I'm saying investments in this particular context, I'm thinking of a mutual fund. All a mutual fund is is a group of stocks or bonds. One of the measurements 
is volatility. How much up or down does it do? And that's called beta. So if we assign the proxy for the market as being the S&P, S&P 500, 500 different companies is supposed to make up the U.S. economy, that would be a beta of one. That's our measure. That's the market. So if a mutual fund has a beta, the green is positive, the red is negative. If So look over at the right-hand side in the green. It has a beta of three. It's three times more volatile or fluctuates three times more than the market. So if the S&P went up 10%, how much would you expect the investment to go up? 30%. Three times as much. So that's the one I want, Steve. I want to make 30%. Now remember, we don't know what's going to happen with investments. So that means if the market goes down 10%, a third of your money is gone. Okay, so that's the thing a good financial advisor can help you with. You weigh out all these factors. It's more art than science. You know, if it was just science and plugging in numbers, you know, we, we'd all be rich. So if you're more conservative, you can go over to the left-hand side of beta 0.1. So it's one-tenth as volatile. The market goes up 10%, you get 1%. Okay? But the good news is if it goes down percent, 10%, you lose that little bit. So it's not a right or wrong. It's what can I deal with? Because if you sell every time the market goes down, you're never going to realize the return. All these... The returns John quoted, the ones you see on here, that's all predicated on you being able to see the investment through to the end. Otherwise, you don't realize the return. That's easier said than done. If you're on a roller coaster and it gets scared, do you jump off? I, I hope not. So, market's the same way. Just because it's going up and down, you need to know. You need to know what the roller coaster is going to be like before you get on it. Let's talk about taxes and inflation. You want to think about how your investments are affected by taxes, but that's not the only thing. I mean, you, you don't want to overdo it. If you add all those numbers up, you'll come up to about 111 days, something like that. So it takes you about close to between 25% and one third of the working year to work and earn enough money to cover the taxes that you pay. Some people get all hung up on, well, I'm going to do all this to avoid taxes. And it's okay to take taxes into account, just don't overdo it. I've had people sit in my office and say, you know, get their hands. Well, I got I hate taxes, and I got this investment, it's an ostrich farm, and I'm gonna lose all this money and I'm not gonna pay any taxes because it's gonna be a big deduction. I sit there and look like you're a grown man saying that. Do you realize what you're saying? You're still out the money. I'm going to lose $50,000, so I won't have to pay any taxes. Go, go to it. Yeah. You're still out the money. Yeah. So, tax deferral. We're talking about that's an important thing. It's, and it's a good thing. That, that's the main thing you would want to take advantage of at this point in your lives. Because you, you can't get out of taxes. Y'all may have heard the thing, what's the difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion? About 20 years in the penitentiary. <laughs> okay. You can't get out of paying taxes. You can delay them. That's all tax deferred means, tax delay. So you're going to have to pay uncle money sooner or later. Just make them wait longer to pay. That's all tax deferral is. So how about inflation? Historically, 3 or 4%, depending on who you ask. This is kind of an interesting chart. I could... I could have opine on this for a while, but 64 happens to be when I was born. New house, $13,000. The income was six grand. New car was 3,500. Now look what it was in 2014. The interesting thing to me is on this. Look at the look at the ratios here. So in 64, 6,000 a house. People on average buying houses about twice twice their income. Car maybe a little more than half their income. Now, look at the average income versus the house and the debt people are carrying. That's what's crippling people and saving for retirement. Just because those are the averages don't, doesn't mean you got, you got to spend 400000 on a house. You can, but you got to ask yourself, just because I could, 
Does that mean I should? Here, here's a here's the simple budget guideline I use. But I'm you, now you can this will be applicable. You remember this, you will be okay. Whatever you make, make X. Whatever X is, live on X. Live on X minus twenty percent. So live on eighty percent and save or invest twenty percent. So you just keep that equation through your entire career. It's self-adjusting. You make more money, still hold to that. I've seen people become wealthy doing that. The hard part is the discipline. It's as our income increases, what you tend to do is elevate your lifestyle. And then if it gets out of control, you don't live on X minus 20%. I've met people living on X plus 20%. And it's, they got a lot of cash flow, but they're not worth anything. So just keep that in mind. That's easier said than done. You know, there's simple and there's easy. And y'all know what the difference between that is, right? Simple. Simple is if I had a 350-pound barbell here, all right? It's simple to lift that. It's a simple motion. I, I could not do it anymore. Well, it, without severe medical bills. Procrastination. You want to get started as soon as you can, even if it's just a little bit. This this particular slide is based on a $250,000 portfolio invested over 20 years at 6%. If you did the whole 20 years in the top number, 250 would grow to $800,000. If you waited 10 years, you'd have 400, 447. That's still a lot of money. But would you rather have 800,000 or 440,000? Time is your friend. It can be your enemy, too, if you wait too long. So the idea of this slide is not to depress you, saying, well, I don't have 250000 to invest. The idea is to say, just start and get in the habit, in a lifestyle of saving and investing. It's just like health. I know that healthy living is a bigger topic now than it was when I was in Sweden. When I was here 30 years ago, you know, beer was healthy. You know, it's got wheat, it's got hops in it. I mean, those are all natural ingredients. Those are healthy. I mean, there was no talk of, of health. But now, it's a lifestyle, a healthy lifestyle. Investing and being financially secure is the same way. So some things to get you started as we close. It's a good idea to do a personal income statement. So if you're non-business and accounting majors, just list out income if you have any right now. If you don't, you will someday. Income, less your expenses. All right, you want that to be a positive number. That means you're living on X, less something. So try to live on 80%, save 20%. You want that income statement to be a positive number. A balance sheet, that's simply your assets, less your liabilities. Again, you want that to be a, a positive number. Look at your long, long-term, medium-term, short-term goals. Invest appropriately for that. And how much appetite for risk do you have? Not a right or wrong answer on that. Just be honest with yourself. Like, Can I take it if it goes down? If the answer is no, well, then just, you're not cut out for investing. That doesn't mean you spend all your money. It just means perhaps you're a saver. You can save it in the credit union or the bank. Just don't spend it. So there's a difference here. You always got to live on less than you make. That's the secret. That's the secret to life. It's not often advertised and it's not glamorous, but uh, it is true.